Thank you. Um, can I first uh, thank Eamon for the fantastic introduction and can I thank uh, Francoise and where is Mark sitting? There he is for inviting me. So I feel very honored. I'm a little, a little bit feeling under the weather. So if I'm not so enthusiastic as I'm normally, I'm just shout. So the reason why I like interaction is that I hate lecturing. I come from uh, Maastricht University and we do problem-based learning at Maastricht University. So standing in front of a crowd is really boring. So um, there's going to be lots of interaction. You can choose what we're going to discuss today, which is quite interesting. Um, so just to pick your brain, also to get to know who you are and to understand where we're from. Every, do you know what formal, informal learning is? Yes? You know, I guess, what social interaction is between two people or more people. What is, what is learning analytics? What is learning analytics? What's the, what's the word that comes up? Data. Data. Sorry, I didn't. Uh huh. Okay. What more? What do you? What's the feeling that you have from learning analytics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not only student learning, it's also about a process, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So is, is Dublin City University using learning analytics? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Interactions. Yeah. It's quite interesting. I always do this kind of exercise, and I've done this version in different versions, um, I think now five or six times. And you're the first audience that hasn't mentioned negative elements yet <laughs> of learning <laughs> analytics. So I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> what? <Privacy>. Ethics. <laughs> I was going to say, you, using those data to target um, interventions for students to try and help them with their learning? Yeah. I just saw a fantastic uh, piece, sorry, I forgot your name. Mark. Mark, see, I didn't know that was Mark, because, but there can't be two Marks. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, he's Mark too. He <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2.0. Yeah. Um, he's doing some interesting stuff, and he's already targeting students based on their behavior, so that's really... So, you, you don't really have a negative feeling with learning analytics, or you do? Mm -hmm. Good question. It, I, did, how, how does it work here? Have you informed your students about this? Yeah, we had an opt-in policy. Mm -hmm. Did students opt out? They did. How many? Uh, well, the exact figure but it's a relatively small percentage. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where's the boundary of where's the boundary of what happens in terms of learning inside the classroom or inside of ELE and outside? That's yeah. Um, but what's new? Sorry. What's new? In what way? But they've had it for a long time. Yes. So We've been suddenly learning and learning. Yeah. 
When I applied for this uh, readership in learning analytics, people were like, yeah, but you're an economist. Why? I mean, I, I, I've only started publishing and learning analytics with learning analytics in, my, in the title mm. one year ago. Mm. But all the, th I mean, in the 60s, people were already collecting loads amounts of data and trying to help our students. But uh, how do you interpret the data? Mm -hmm. I think for me, that's uh, the big, big question. Yeah. Because depending yeah. on your learning theory, yeah. you, you could, you know, not every single learning theory allows you to predict. Yeah. Um. Maybe that's a why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only the what, yeah. the why. Yeah. We, are, we think at the Open University that we are the first institute in the world to have an ethics policy for learning analytics. And we tweeted this, and it's in Times Higher Education. Thus far, no one said the contrary. But many people, at least at the Open University, are very concerned about learning analytics. And when we did a consultancy with 100 students, many students, on the one hand, were like, yeah, I don't want you to follow me. And I don't want you to know that I'm posting something on the internet or that I'm disabled or that I'm particular color or that I'm a woman with three children, I'm, I'm divorced or whatever. But at the same time, many students indicated, yeah, but I've been dropping out and I'm failing with my course and I was really surprised that no one contacted me. So there is on the one hand this concern about privacy and on the other hand this need, at least in, in the Open University, of a kind of I need this personalization. So there's lots of tensions. And um, if I can find remo the remote, which I have no idea where I left. Or did I put it in my pocket? Here we go. So today I want to have a debate with you. And to start the debate, I mean, um, so the definition of learning analytics, the classical definition, it's the measurement, which you said before, uh, collection analysis of reporting of data about learners and their context and for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning to help them to learn uh, in, in environments that has occurred. That's the classical definition that was only d uh, listed in 2011. I personally think it lacks the kind of sociocultural element. So my colleagues in uh, my team, Rebecca Ferguson, um, says that sh we should focus on social learning analytics. That is basically how do people build knowledge together within the context of their social cultural environment. And I actually quite like that definition, right? So has anyone seen a picture like this? I mean, you have, because you've been to the Eurocall. Anyone seen this? Um, what's the story of the picture? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I should. I don't have to come here. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. So the problem I have uh, with this picture is with the VLE or the LMS system and all this analytics and then a kind of a visualization <coughs> and the teachers then reflecting on all these visualizations and then comes up with some kind of informed judgment what students should do. I like it as a simplification, but I think the real power um, would come if we would start to link students to this. And what you're doing, I think, links to, uh, links to this as well, and also linking the students to the teacher. So, so the one of the principles of the um, of the learning or of the ethics policy that we designed for learning analytics is that students are not a number. Students, uh, learning analytics is a moral practice. So, teachers, when they're judging students, they're not just numbers in a graph. There are stories behind this, and I think we all agree. Mm -hmm. So we all. Um, so. Um, normally, I have to explain what learning analytics is, and I always take a metaphor of football. Um, you, who is this guy? <laughs> Everyone knows this guy? No? For the people who don't know this, who this guy is, who is he? 
Louis van Gaal, yes. And the story in terms of learning analytics, and to show you in a kind of layman's term what learning analytics is all about, I'm going to focus on my hero, <laughs> the, and basically the rise and fall of my hero. So I have a very short YouTube movie, and given that I'm from the Netherlands, I'm just going to share this. <laughs> Do you remember this goal? What a world goal! I was sitting in France with my wife on a, on a, on a, on a square. Um, we were the only Dutch people on the square. All the French were supporting the Spanish. <laughs> and I, we were one nil down and I was like, oh, this is the most fantastic moment of the day. And then we scored another time and we scored another time and we, after the fourth or the fifth goal, people were tapping my shoulders. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't celebrate so loudly. So I, no one guessed that we would even make it to the next round because we thought, oh, we have an awful team. They, they lost the previous, previous European championship. So we thought they're never going to win. So when we, the thing which you probably don't know is that footballers are continuously tracked in terms of learning analytics. So you can see exactly what Robin van Persie is doing um, continuously. And you can do this real time with a service called Squacker. Um, so this is, this is Learning Analytics 2014. So wh what, what do you see in this particular picture? <laughs> You're nodding like, what the F word is this? <laughs> <laughs> so the Dutch are focused on goal and the Spanish are yeah. not getting into the box at all. No, no. So it's, and all the players' movement and where the passes are going and whether they're going back and whether they're going forward. But it's, it's lots and lots and lots of data. Is this data useful to interpret who is going to win or not? Yeah, you can. This, this is real time? Well, okay, this is a screenshot after the match. So this is like after 90 minutes. But you can do real-time analysis when, when you're playing, and especially if you pay a certain fee, then you can watch it real-time. So uh, at halftime, you may be able to change tactics. Yes, yes, yes. For me, I wouldn't have a clue what it's saying. <laughs> me, me neither, me neither. So this is a, s a simplified picture. Um, what was again, I forgot oh, uh, again what was the... So the sp Spain is playing that way. They have one goal in that direction from that position. And they had loads of, I mean, that even one went completely off target here. <laughs> and the Dutch had fantastic goals on that side. And then the analytics allows you not only to drill on a, on a kind of course level, uh, but it also allows you to drill on each individual player. And you can see in this predictive modeling, Van Percy is compared to Van Percy previously, so continuously what his performance is, and then initially he was, well, not great, or just similar to what he's done before, but then he scored this magical goal, and then he, came, he went from strength to strength in terms of his performance, and there is this other guy, Arjen Robben, I don't know if you know him, well, <laughs> he's a lousy player, but from Percy he was like, he was my, he's, he's my hero. So the fundamental question is then, of course, um, we lost in the semi-finals. So I'm just wondering, he got, he got five stars during his first play, and during the semi-finals, he got only one and a half star. And if we have all this learning analytics, all this data to our disposal, why didn't this fantastic world-leading coach intervene? So what I would like you to do is to talk to your neighbor for one or two minutes. This was, the, this was the match against Argentina, this fantastic screenshot. And what I would like you to do is to discuss where, if you would be Van Gaal, if you would be the teacher, where would you have intervened in the performance of Robin van Persie? One minute. Go ahead.
Do you remember the answer? No, I don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, if I ask the group over there, where where should Van Gaal, Van Gaal? Apparently, you pronounce it in English, but it's weird. He's Van Gaal. Why? Where should he have intervened, according to you, over there? Well, the two dips are. Uh, First of all, you see, what are you comparing? You're comparing him to, to, to Robin. No, 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 you're, prepar <coughs> you're comparing him to the previous Van Persie. So all the, all the data you have about Van Persie and how well he's, in terms of, you know, the positioning and how well he's playing. So it's like an, an, a, the history of his previous Van Persie, you're using that. And in comparison to the previous history of how well Van Persie plays, that's his benchmark. Okay, so where it dips is, is probably halfway through the first half, halfway through the second half. Mm -hmm. So uh, you would think that if you wanted to raise his performance, that's where you should be. Uh, the only thing is, if you're comparing him to Robin, which is here or not, uh, uh, but if you were, the performance of Robin might be. Uh, Unpredictable, and it's that unpredictability yeah. that what, uh, is what swings the game. Oh yeah, I see some puzzled mm, I disagree. I don't know. I mean, for me, the, the points of ten and fifteen minutes, they they don't really mean much in terms of performance. Yeah. And the trend is distinctly downwards. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying after 15 minutes? Yeah, 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, because then you have to ask, well, if you take them off that quick, then people will have a substitute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We took them off. Yeah, just shout at them. Yeah. You if I was coach, I would make any decision based on that. Why not? Because a team is made up is greater than the sum of the individual players. Mm -hmm. So for me to understand what that means, I need to know what the other players around him are doing and how the performance. Mm -hmm. So if, if yeah. he is dropping relative to his teammates, yeah. then maybe there's something to be read into that. But I wouldn't be satisfied to make a decision just on that individual player. Mm -hmm. We came up with something similar to that. We were saying it's not just as soon as you know something is disimproving, it has to be that combined with an opportune time to interfere, yep. trying to make a judgment call on the best time yep. to do it. And also the, the existing knowledge that you have, so mm. we're just discussing here that everyone can have an off day. You know, yep. We were talking about students as well. But in terms of the observation and the status of the match and what's going on, I think if you know them and you know the background information, you would have to come in in the 10, 15 minute mm -hmm. mark. But I agree with Mark as well, the variables mm. on the pitch yep. are too late. You actually could intervene if you believe in statistics in the pure data. Yeah. But previously, you know that he's good enough to score. Yeah. To yeah. I mean, if so we if. When or why you should take the so until until a certain point in time, he's, he he was under par. He, mm -hmm. um, and these 
genius players, you know, they just need one chance and then they score. So, I mean, it's, what, what I think is nice, is kind of, this is a metaphor of teaching, of course, uh, is on the one hand, data is extremely messy and it's only what you actually can measure, you know, the, the, the number of passes, the positioning where people are walking, but you don't really know what's, what's in the minds and hearts of people. And you don't know what you're saying is the, the interactions between those. And also you don't really know, you know, the informal part of learning that is not captured. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is, on the one hand, my title says that I have to be very positive about learning analytics, and I am. But I think at the same time there are some caveats that I would like to discuss. And we know, for example, in hindsight, that Van Persie, like me, was a little bit under the weather that day. Um, and you could have... He scored a brilliant goal on Saturday the other week. Yeah, 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 nearly, nearly the same. But then he, the, then he missed, and then ten minutes later he scored this fantastic goal. So, so it's like it's very difficult to to go into the psychology, and that you need a little bit of luck, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I'm gonna propose something really weird. I'm gonna give you a menu option. Um, I only have one hour, and there's so much to talk. There's so much data we can share. I also have loads of things which I didn't put on slides, but we can discuss. So we have a kind of interaction. So you can choose three courses, or you can say I want to have something else and just shout what you want. So I could show you um, one of the studies we did on the power of formal and informal learning. So I'm just going through the menu now at the moment. I can show you the, the power of formal and informal learning between teachers and how they learn inside and outside um, their practice. Um, I can show you a, a couple of studies that show how do students actually make a mix, how do they pick and choose in terms of all the VLE tools that they have at their disposal and how does that relate to uh, their behavior and performance. Um, I could show you a fantastic study. This is, this is the main piece of this. <laughs> Um, in an adaptive mathematics online environment with over 120 different variables that we measured um, over a period of time. Or I could show you um, a study uh, which is not yet published, but it's at the OU how we compared 40 modules and looking at, okay, how does learning design of those 40 modules linked to the experience of students, but also how that linked to uh, performance and what's underlying all of this. So if I can just do a very simple show by hand. So you, you can select three courses given the time. And then if there's time left, I would just do the rest. Um, so <laughs> three courses you can choose. So I'm just going to, who, who wants to see uh, number one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. Let, let me just remind myself, <laughs> because we're in analytics. Twelve, yes? <laughs> number two, who is interested in number two? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, who is interested in number three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, yes? I can only vote three times, eh? Yeah, yeah, I'm not, and I'm not checking if you're actually, yeah. Or, uh, number four? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And number five, who is interested in five? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so you're going to skip the most interesting study. <laughs> well, let's see how far we get. And then, um, um, so the power of formal and informal learning. Um, so I have a kind of provocative question, which is basically, and this is linked to the informal study that we did, um, if 80% of our students learn more outside the classroom than they learn inside the classroom or inside the VLE, what are we measuring, right? Um, the next one, which links partly to this, the third study, 
is what kind of data is actually useful to collect in terms of VLE. Uh, and the third one, um, which you haven't chosen, so I'm not going to discuss this then. Um, just a little bit of context. In our latest study, we distinguish between uh, learner data and learning data. So learner data, we, it's about Van Persie, how tall he is, how fit he is, how which size shoe he has, what kind of shirt he's wearing, you know, the kind of baggage that you bring before the play, before you come to the ground. And learning data is what some of you also mentioned, you know, the process, what's, what's actually happening when, there's him, when he's on the pitch and plays all those balls, and how can you then uh, measure those. And we think that learning analytics, um, there's so everyone talks about learning analytics, but what are you actually, what are you trying to measure? So this is a study we did in um, uh, a face-to-face -face institution, so not really learning analytics in a way. Um, so one of my PhD students, she was interested in a medical program using problem-based learning. So problem-based learning, everyone is working in small groups of 12. They continuously meet for half a year in those groups of 12. And then the assumption is, is that they primarily learn within those groups of 12. That's the assumption, right? Um, so then we used a principle called social network analysis to see, okay, are they indeed learning only within the group or also are they also learning outside the group? So this is the picture. What does, what does the picture show you? It's very similar to the football pitch, you know, with all the passes, but it's something different. Any idea? Yeah. Yeah. So this student has indicated of the 400 students in my medical program, I'm learning from one student. And all the other 399 students, independently from that student, verified, no, I'm not learning from him or her. While people who are very central in the network are people that many people go to, but it's also they might go to many people to discuss their learning. So what do you think the colors are? The color, yeah, the colors, uh, bl black and white and gray. Sorry, it's not a, it's not a color indeed. <laughs> yeah, achievement data, yeah, it's achievement data. And what does it, what does it show you? Mm -hmm. So if you look with a quite weird angle, you see there are lots of white students on the fringes. And the more you get to the center, the relatively more darker the color, so the higher the grade. The more social, the higher the grade. Yes. So Your players are dark too. Yes. So it's, it's not, and that's again this learning analytics. This is data on the general picture. So. We then thought, okay, but there are loads of other factors that influence this. So we looked. Can I yeah. you know, does it get darker when you get to the middle? Because you'll always find on the extremes of the thing that yeah. you find people who are. Yeah. It's sort of what we would expect somebody yeah. who is unconnected with their family. Yeah. Classmates. Yeah. There is. The there is a, a person here which we talked about before who only has two friends, but they're very dark. I have no idea what his learner because he could come there with a whole other prior knowledge about that particular subject that he's been set on. Yeah, so I like modeling. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What would the size of the nodes, what does that look like? The size is uh, the kind of uh, betweenness effect. So uh, are they, sorry, that's a social network jargon. It's like how many people are connecting to you and how many people are you connecting yeah. to others? So the, the bigger the size, the more okay. you're a kind of bridge builder. Yeah. yeah. Is there any kind of um, investigation into introversion, extroversion? Yeah, the that's a very good question, yeah. yeah. So this is just one model to look at it. So we try to, for example, control for prior knowledge. We try to control for motivation. We didn't look in this particular case, introvert, extrovert, but in other studies we've done this. 
Um, we look at to what extent they feel, feel academically integrated into the, and then you get into this weird thing called structural equation modeling. Um, so we looked at, okay, what actually predicts student learning? And of course, previous performance on modules heavily influences how well you're doing um, over time. But that's a causal assumption. That's not accurate in the sense all it is is um, that there is a relationship that is not the cause necessarily. Sure. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so that's also one. There is an, in, in a structural equation modeling way, we can then control for this. So the, the direction walks in that way. If it's the other way around, then so it's, it's an assumption we make in the data modeling. So what we found quite surprisingly was that you know, the way students, whether they <coughs> feel integrated or not, or whether they're motivated or not, didn't influence. But to our largest surprise, the number of people that people were in in terms of the network was the best in terms of the number, the best predictor for performance. So it's like it's, it's weird in a sense. So with whom you're networking, has a massive influence on your performance. Sorry, did you ask them to specify who they work with and communicate? Yes, yeah, so we, I, I should have explained this in a, a little bit more detail. So we asked them, um, who are your friends? And we specified, you know, going for a beer or going to the movies or discussing personal issues. Um, we asked them, with whom do you give information in terms of, uh, well, uh, how to solve a particular medical problem or how, how, where to find a good article on arthrosis or whatever. And to whom do you give information? So we have a kind of fine-grained quantitative understanding of this. Um, and then Juliette afterwards did loads of qualitative studies as well to further unpack those uh, reasons. Um, so we were initially surprised that there was this massive social network effect. So then we look even f further and we went back to, the, to the, these small groups of 12 and we assumed that most students would primarily you know, learn this is one group, this is another group, and this is another group, etc., etc. And uh, we were in for a surprise. So there are approximately um, 40 groups and you have to bear with me a little bit. Uh, this is an, another graph which is difficult to explain. Um, everything which is below zero means that people in a group are more inward focused than outward focused. Everything above zero until one, that's an index, they are more outward focused and not inward focused. So in terms of whom do they give information they seem to be mostly outward focused, but also from whom do they get information? It's mostly outward focused. So what we found, that the vast number of groups except these three learned more outside their group than they learned inside. And did they have classroom opportunity to learn more or was it just outside <coughs> the class? Um, so the only thing they did was they had once a week a lecture on, I don't know what, um, heart functioning or whatever. And then the rest of the time they always met with a tutor on these small groups. I'm sorry, was it self-selecting or were they designated? Designated. So it's really, it's, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of VLE activities, um, they are assigned to a particular group. So if you would track VLE behavior, you would only track certain part of the learning. If, if the largest part of the learning occurs outside the classroom, you know, when they go to the library, when they're sitting here having lunch, how do you, how do you measure that? But do you think, though, that that's a function of a problem-based learning thing? If you try to replicate yeah. that in a, in a different learning yeah. paradigm, yeah. Thank you for asking this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the study uh, here with me, but um, um, if you just Google me, um, this is a Spanish woman. We did exactly the same study in a classical Spanish university, and you find exactly the same, that most students, or even if they're allocated in traditional lecture rooms and they work in small groups, they mostly learn with people outside their designated room in um, Finland, uh, with Kun Veermans. 
uh, primary school children, same mechanism. Um, we did loads of studies in, uh, in, in the UK, of course. And again, you find that most, most groups, even if they're working together for half a year, they continuously maintain informal links outside those groups because we're human creatures. If you decide we're in one group together, I will still publish with my mates from the Netherlands and from Spain, and, and I still have my friends from Sweden where I was in God knows when ago. So it's, 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 it's quite intuitive. This, this goes against learning analytics in a way because you can't collect that data unless you do social network analysis. What's the implication for football? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with partying. You know. <laughs> um, it is, it is uh, I mean, as an anecdote, many football players, when they go from one club to the other, the first thing they do is call their mates who are actually playing there. Is it actually a good thing to go there? So, you know, it's, it's part of life. Networking is continuously important. Uh, my son is yeah. just starting to talk about my son is four. He started school this year. And he, being an anxious parent, he said, who, who do you know in school? And yeah. he friends and so on. And they sit at a different table every month. So yeah. they rotate them. Tables of about seven or eight students. Yeah. And he's a very good memory, so he remembers everybody's name in the class yeah. and he knows who sits at each table and what order they sit. Um, but so he, every month they ha sit at a new table, but every when I can extract this information, extracting the data, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> any analytical yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he has the same s small number of friends that yeah. he plays on yard, despite yeah. switching tables over of course. three months. Of course. And the research by Juliet, and it's published in PLUS One, she, she measured this over a period of two years afterwards. And um, the first group that students were in is still the same group after two years. It's like 80% um, prediction accuracy. So we're going to skip the next study given time, so I will just give this slides later on. So most students learn, 80% of the students, oh. I just want to ask, um, so this 80% figure seems like some sort of natural equilibrium. Yeah, I like to link it with Pareto. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, have there been attempts to, if you like, shift that balance in one way or the other? Like, I mean, obviously, if you were to go with, you know, the, yeah. the well, 80%, well, let's get rid of formal uh, yeah. education completely. Yeah. Let's go 100%. Yeah, we... Um, um, it's such a great crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> Another study which I haven't included here is we, we try to manipulate this. So Juliet, for example, the next study she did, the 400 students, 50, two groups of 50 were continuously assigned with the same people and the other 300 were randomly assigned. And you could see over time that there were two separate islands of these 50 people by the way we assign people over time. In another study, we um, um, mixed people based on their social networks. And then you can just see, you can manipulate, of course, the network. And it has a profound influence over time. So you, you, we as teachers can change that, and particularly in, in cross-cultural settings. If we put students in a mixed cross-cultural group and we put them together for a very long time, suddenly they're all friends. So that's really cool, so you can influence this. Mm. I, I just want to agree with you because I'm looking at communities yeah. of practice yeah. and um, from the students themselves, they're saying the timing of that intervention is very important. Yeah. And all the variables, the variables of the idiosyncratic nature of lecturing, yeah. you know, who uses technology and who doesn't. Yeah. But the fact that when they get together in first year, they're going to pick Facebook for their social network. Yeah. Whereas if you can get in with an intervention before that, they will do their forming yeah. together on that intervention yeah. instead, so you can yeah. and design it to a certain yeah. extent. So in a way, it's, it's creepy, because similar in yeah. learning analytics, we can manipulate this. Yeah. Um, and, but nonetheless, it's... But just to follow up on the yeah. manipulation, so what, in terms of actual performance, if you want a, a yeah. learning performance, yeah. is there a function of this 80-20 divide? Or yeah, so what, what our research seems to indicate, but it's still, I mean, we're, we're con 
Coincidentally, one of my PhD students is, do this, is doing this again on Monday. She's manipulating students in the different groups. So if you put good students together with slightly weaker students, then the, the weaker students over time become better because they're in this smaller group. So you could then start to play around with those kind of variables. Um, well, the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you believe Vygotsky, t uh, you learn more from teaching than from, learn, uh, from learning it yourself. So in a way, they also learn mm -hmm. from it. But there, the evidence, at least, is a little bit... Mm. <laughs> um, I find as well an intergenerational yeah. dimension yeah. between traditional students and mature students, yeah. that there was a bridging um, effect within an online space that spilled over into physical after they were put together in that way. Yeah. Which is very interesting. It is, it, is, it, is, it is fascinating and in a way, and that's why I don't like this initial learning analytics mm. picture because it's, learning is much more messy than you would expect. So I skipped to study two, go to study three. Um, this is an online course, so you, for those who came for the learning analytics uh, element, yes, there is data and there's online behavior. Um, so these is our students, again in Maastricht, relatively small sample. Um, mostly international students and they, in contrast to Dutch students who didn't, uh, most international students don't have economics in secondary education. So we give them a kind of online crash course before they start. And in line with my own philosophies of learning, those were social, so they had to meet online in discussion forums to discuss economics problems and to work on it. And at the same time, every, every week we had video conferencing. And then one of my PhD students, he coded, you know, did they use webcams, did they use the whiteboard, did they use chat, you know, did they use audio? And then he looked at, does how students choose those technologies, does that actually influence how they're learning and does it actually influence performance? So coming back to a question to you, because I've been talking already way too long. So this is a kind of the structure of the course. They met online synchronous and then asynchronous and again online synchronous asynchronous which one which element do you think is the best predictor for how well students are performing over time asynchronous, asynchronous. you read my paper <laughs> <laughs> you read this paper <laughs> why do you think it's asynchronous Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we thought that, you know, the fact um, in the community of inquiry model, teaching presence is very important and also social presence is very important. And initially in my PhD, I only focus on discussion forms, but it's quite difficult to give the social feeling of learning. And we thought, oh, you can actually see, you know, a teacher. Here I am with a slightly different haircut. Um, you know, that, that, um, that the, the ability to, to, to help your students is much better in synchronous environments. So then we again did a path model and you again see then, you see a picture like this. So what do you see in the picture? And this is amazing because I actually see people counting and looking at us. It. Like normally when I give this like, oh my God, this is way too complex. So on this side we have, we knew what kind of motivation students had. Extrinsic motivation is I, d I study economics because I want to be rich. Or my parents told me if you study economics you're going to be rich. Intrinsic is, oh I really want to know why we're still so much in a difficult economic situation and I really like economics. And a motivation is, I literally don't give a toss why I'm here. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why do you think that intrinsic motivation is the only line that links? Why do you think that is the case? Yes. So students who are really intrinsically motivated to study, in this case, economics, they're engaged. They don't probably don't need to tutor even. Um, and why is it that there is this line going through from posting behavior. And why is it that 
there is no link with the, the video conference, you think? No significant link, sorry. Because they were motivated already. Mm -hmm. But why isn't it not important to be present in this case at a, at a video conference, at least not in the first model? So they're doing the import, the out the eight, they're in the 80%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. If they feel it from someone else, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the weird thing is, I mean, exam dropped out for some reason on the slide. Um, so intrinsically motivated students do well. They post a lot. They post more over time, and they then do well. Um, and of course, they attend more video conferences after time. But what about those extrinsically motivated students? What 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 kind of what do they do? Whatever gives them credit. Sorry. Whatever gives them credits. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they, unfortunately, are more likely then to, to drop out. Um, and that's quite difficult. And then I think in many online environments, you see that the ones who do extremely well are people who, are, who have a particular kind of motivation that is encouraging them to learn. So. You sure you don't want to see the fourth study? <laughs> um, let's go first to the fifth one because I, I have to finish at two. Just, well, we, just to, so people know, we do have uh, afternoon tea yep. coming sometime soon, but we are here for as long okay. as yeah. you know, okay. can slip I will qu quickly right. skip through and I can always come back. So just ignore this for the moment. I don't think people will be too concerned. Okay. So okay. Just okay. Um, so this is not published yet, so please don't cite this or <laughs> turn off your <laughs> large part. <laughs> um, so this is at the OU, where I'm actually working, so it's nice to link it with my own real world. Um, so we have this thing called learning design, uh, where uh, we have an online tool, which I can show the link later, that um, maps what, what the learning design philosophy is of each individual module. And then a learning design specialist together with the module chair goes through each of the design decisions that uh, a teacher makes. And loads of stuff. This is, I think, a health, health course. But I can't tell this because it has to be uh, anonymous. And then we, we, we basically tag the kind of activities that students are expected to do based on the learning design. So in this case, 40% of the activities are assimilative, so reading, um, you know, learning, and a bit of writing. 2% is finding new information in this particular module. 5% is discussing with peers. Um, 21 is productive. It's like um, in healthcare, it's actually trying to, you know, to put on a wristband or to to, I don't know, put in a needle, you know, to, to learn what it's like. Uh, they didn't use any experimental stuff here, very little adaptive, and then, of course, assessment. So for each of these modules we had, uh, thus far we've mapped around 100. We mapped, okay, what's the learning design? Do you have something similar in your institute that you do it in this way? Because one of the things in the Innovative Pedagogy report is that we say, okay, learning analytics is great, but if you don't know what, in terms of data, you're actually looking at, it's quite difficult to make links. So taking the metaphor again of football, you would expect that the graphs of the Spanish team will be very different than the graphs of a German team. Right? So uh, the, the way the German coach designs the, the team play, or the way we design, is very different from the ones, okay? Yeah. What is the proportion of support staff yeah. like yourself working with teachers to the number of teachers like? Uh, ooh, very difficult question. It depends on uh, on on the size of the module. So, in the in the large level one uh, course or year one courses, let's say four thousand students, um, each course has. Mm -hmm. A specific tutor, we call him an associate lecturer, yeah. who works with a group of 20 yeah, yeah. very intensively together. 
um, but at the same time they get support from uh, well from one or two teachers over those 4,000 students. But it's, uh, who's working with the teachers to do this form of intense um, course analysis? Oh sorry, so oh, yeah, 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 I should have mentioned this. Um, this is people from my institute, from the Institute of Education Technology, so learning design specialists are working together with module chairs, sorry that's jargon from the OU, with, with uh, uh, module conveners um, to, to, to map all this out. I'm just looking at workload in yeah. terms of the number of people that you've yeah. got and the number of people who are yeah. teaching yeah. and how you can actually yeah. use the two together. Yeah. So this is a very, this, this takes um, our learning designers three days per module. Mm -hmm. So it's a tremendous amount of work. Uh, but we think in order to understand learning analytics, we need to understand the uh, strategy behind. Yeah? Um, so then what we, what we did, and I, I'm hoping that you can see kind of a narrative, is we tried to see, okay, are teachers designing unique courses or are there kind of patterns that are fairly similar? Um, so we found out four different categories, and I will explain them in a minute. So the first category is what we call constructivist clusters. So people have lots of things to in terms of content, I see nothing yet. Very, lots of reading that students have to do, uh, very limited experiential stuff and assessment. That's one category of courses. Then another recipe of courses is loads of assessment activities during the module and then limited other things. And then there's a mix of um, well, lo uh, relatively more finding activities and lots of experiential learning. And um, the fourth one, which we call a social constructivist, which is lots of communication, lots of these productive activities. Uh, Moodle, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so this is basically how um, the, the, the module convener has designed the module yeah. um, based on a kind of the blueprint. So yeah, if the different activities within Moodle have yeah, utilized the one in the What I'm saying is that Moodle actually supports a social Yes, system. yes. Because for some people, they don't consider that to be the emphasis. It's more yes. Driven. So perhaps I shouldn't say this uh, in front of a camera, but it's quite surprising that the vast majority of our courses are classical, yeah. knowledge-driven. Yes, yes, yes. You should come and work at, the, at our university and tell us. But I'd like to know how Moodle does it. I mean, Moodle is this platform. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Moodle is how, it's not built in with any predefined pedagogical... No, no, no. So this, this is purely based on, on like the kind of battle plan, the recipes that, that module chairs have produced. In a way, they could use any kind of combination, you know, have 10 Van Persies in your group and then, or have none of them. It's, it's basically, it's whatever people decide to and do. Just, just to add, yeah. my own thesis is on work in Hibernia yeah. College, which is an online college yeah. here. I found that <coughs> despite what the literature is saying, that mm. most of the learning should be social constructive, yeah. it was mostly transmission and yeah. transmission of, yeah. of so information. So let's, let's, okay, let's, um, which one do you think is, the, is more beneficial for learning in terms of performance of these four? Who thinks that one is the most beneficial? Constructivist, so loads of reading. Who thinks that two is loads of assessments, continuous assessments? Well, one. it depends what the assessment yeah, 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 yeah. Learning being measured by Yeah, by performance and by, by how many people actually met in the OU. One of the things is that many people drop out because of distance education. So you would hope that a learning design would help students to continue to study. So learning is being measured by the achievement defined in Yeah, fine. A, a number of people who pass the course and with the number of grade. Um, which one, who thinks that ba a social constructivist is the best way? Okay. Okay, let's have a look. This is, this is very tentative. This is only, again, a health and safety warning. 
only 40 modules. This is not the truth. There might be other designs. So with all this health and safety, um, this is what students think. So we, I've linked this with 20,000 20, students. So typical student surveys and link this with um, the design of the course. Um, and what you t see is that if, I mean, it's not always significant because there are only 40 modules, but in general, if there are lots of assimilative activities, it's always positive, so students like this. Um, if there are lots of finding information activities in it, or lots of communication activities, they report, they who fill in the survey, hmm, hmm. Of course, they don't know that, you know, they can't compare it, but at least if you compare all the surveys of all the modules together, it's, it's quite puzzling to us. Response rate beat on the survey? I probably have to turn off the camera. <laughs> 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 so one of the things, my criticism, I'm not criticizing my fantastic institution, is only students who pass a certain amount of activities, then get the invitation to complete this. So uh, some students who, who drop out in the beginning are not asked this questionnaire. So you have to take this with a pinch of salt. So then let's look at, we like objective behavior, right? Behavior of people. So then we looked at um, VLE behavior. So this is the number of minutes that students spend on a weekly basis and just ignore the third one because this is this very weird. It's, we only had one module at this point in time that we could link with VLE behavior. Um, so what, do you see any patterns in terms of VLE behavior, in terms of the design of um, how modules were implemented? Yeah, so she constructivist is like extremely high. And then over time, <laughs> similar, right? So lots of activities to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And of course, I have to again take it with a pinch of salt because these are averages, and certain modules finish after 12 weeks, certain finish after. 40 weeks, some continue until 60 weeks. Which, which of the light, the, 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 gre uh, the green, the gray, the solid gray. The balance is the, the, the highest peak. Yeah, but that's, that's due to an odd thing. This is only one module. So there is, and this is probably when students had to complete an assessment. That's where they go back to the VLE. Um, so if you look at individual modules, you see this is a constructivist. So hardly anyone spends more than 200 minutes per week in a VLE, and it's mostly, you know, it goes with peaks and troughs linked to assessment. This is the social constructivist. So loads and loads and loads and loads of activities for students to do. Some, one actually goes until 1400. So we immediately you see, okay, the, just by designing the course, the behavior of students is completely different. And that's intuitively logical, right? Um, if you then link this to, um, again, the seven categories, same picture. So the seven categories and then how students over time click and behave. Um, you see that in contrast to the one we said before, finding information and communication, they didn't like it. If there are lots of finding and communicative activities, students spend a tremendous amount of time online. Um, and then the crucial bit, and that's what our pr Pro Vice Chancellor likes, let's look at performance. Um, same same uh, way of portraying. Um, if you have loads of assessments, it's relatively negative in terms of the number of minutes spent online. So performance, um, you get a completely different picture than the first picture from the students. So students liked assimilative in terms of experience, but if modules have loads of assimilative <coughs> activities, the number of people who pass the course is substantially lower, and also in terms of grades, which, we, which I didn't show, um, than modules who have other activities. 
So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say very inarticulate, and this is very much work in progress, is uh, learning design seems to have a very strong influence on behavior and performance. So we can again manipulate. So to come to my conclusion, and I, you didn't see this, but I will send you the paper, is that VLE data, the raw one, doesn't provide very good uh, proxies for learning. And if you would have selected study number four, you would know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the implications of, of learning analytics, partly you can't understand this because you didn't select study four, but <laughs> <laughs> um, what we continuously seem to find in learning analytics, just clicking behavior doesn't really explain learning. It's primarily if you link it to assessments and if you link it to emotions that you can understand it. Perhaps social network analysis could be a good way to measure this informal learning. And um, then a fundamental question coming back to this, when Van Gaal should intervene, I think what I'm trying to show you over time is it's very complex. There is not a clear point in this, if I take a random graph like this, where should you intervene? If this suddenly goes tremendously down from 1400 minutes to, does it then mean that the course is not successful? So it is, it is I mean, I think we're at a, at a kind of crossroad. We, we, we can, yeah? How does the Jilly Salmon steps fit against that data? Have you looked at that? Um, to be honest, I'm not that familiar with... Yeah. <laughs> um, the course design for like the VLE data yeah, yeah, yeah. said in your last slide will only tell you so much yeah. information. There's, there's so much more to, to go with. Can you just post the last slide that has the assessment data on the third Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, keep going back to yeah. that one. There, just going back to one of the points that was made earlier on by yeah. Angela, the performance in the assessment driven courses is actually quite high. Yeah, so yeah, we're testing them all yeah. Time. And Even if we would have, uh, yeah, like yeah, and also if, if we would collect more courses, it probably would become significant. And also, a link which is quite intuitive is the more workload you have, and, and the lower the performance. What, what I would refer to as the dump and pump method, <laughs> where people just dump up, yeah, onto yeah. The it's not working. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the point that you were making towards the end there, are yeah. there valid and reliable measures of emotion in an online environment? Uh, y yes. If you would, if we would have selected study four, <laughs> <laughs> but I will post this all online, and you can you can read it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then in, in in study four, it actually shows that emotions were the best predictor for learning. Um, Yeah. And the feedback that comes in yeah. in terms of learning styles as well. I mean, I know that's a huge area. Yeah. Certainly, I found in my community stuff uh, learners who were theorists and you know didn't necessarily need feedback, but they did like to express themselves online. Yeah. Yeah. So whether they got feedback or not, yeah. they used the GLE an awful lot. Yeah. Just for that. And I think that's also one of the things which is so important is that this uh, learning analytics is a moral practice is that behind the numbers are so many complex elements. Um, and, well, it's, it's... But you also have, behind the numbers, and you have an advantage that yeah. we don't, is the pure, pure size of your institution yeah. and all of your interactions are done yeah. on the DLE, where we yeah. don't have that. Yeah. We're a face-to-face -face institution, so there's only a limited number of modules that this would be applicable for, for us across the way. So uh, thank you for your time and attention, and uh, thank you. Yeah.